Next, we're going to look at, in section 3.3, .3, uh, two kind of related topics. The first, rates of change, we've kind of seen before. Uh, we called it slope, but uh, here we're going to look at also at behaviors of graphs, behavior of graphs, and get some terminology for describing what the graph of a function looks like. Uh, so we're going to start out with these rates of change. The one that we'll focus on is an average rate of, rate of change. Um, you can think of it as the, the way that a quantity of interest changes over time, like miles per hour, I think is the simplest, most familiar example. But you're going to see uh, pretty quickly, since we're talking about the change in y over the change in x, uh, this isn't a fraction, I'm just underlining this phrase that we're defining here, but this is a fraction. The, the ratio or quotient of the change in y over the change in x. Another way to say that is with the Greek letter delta means change, and the change in y, the change in x. It's the same thing as I wrote above, just with a different symbol here. Delta Y over Delta X is a shorter way to write that. Um, the way you've seen it before is Y2 minus Y1. Those are two Y values, and this is the difference between them. So this is how much the Y value changes as, it, as the, the one, um, as the X value changes from X1 to X2. The Y value changes from Y1 to Y2. And this is the familiar slope formula that you've seen when you studied lines in the, the M in Y equals MX plus B. It's Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. But we're going to look at this a slightly different way, which is to think of it as the difference of the values of a function over the difference of the input values of that function, which are the, the x1 and the x2. So f of x1 minus f of f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. It's the same idea as the, the slope formula, only here we're using uh, y is given to us by our function values. So y equals f of x. And that's the kind of thing that we're going to use for the concept of the graph. For right now, though, we're just looking at average rate of, rates of change, and we're going to see a few examples of this last piece, the difference of the function values, or delta f, you could call it, over delta x, or the difference of the x values. First, though, I want to point out some examples of familiar rates of change. Uh, Probably the, the most familiar one that comes to mind quickest is for speed or uh, velocity is another way to say it. But for speed, we're looking at uh, miles per hour. Uh, the abbreviation for that is MPH got its own abbreviation, but miles per hour means uh, number of miles divided by the number of hours. And uh, one way to think of this is if I, if I drive uh, 100 miles in two hours, 100 miles in two hours, 100 divided by two is 50. That's 50 miles per hour. Now that's an average velocity. Uh, I probably wouldn't drive 50 miles an hour the whole time. If my average was 50 miles per hour, of course I'm starting from a standstill and I accelerate. And then I probably go faster than 50 miles per hour to make the average equal to 50. But uh, miles per hour is an example of this. Uh, what this really is though is average 
velocity or uh, v avg so uh, velocity but the average velocity to be specific about how we're describing this and it's distance divided by time if I measure my distance in feet and my time in seconds that'll give me feet per second um, feet per second is a velocity that's used for like the speed of a bullet when it leaves a gun uh, we usually don't talk about our speed of our car in feet per second but you could you could convert to feet per second it's just another way to measure velocity uh, another so that's uh, speed that's a good example another uh, example with automobiles is um, fuel efficiency and uh, usually the way this is measured in the United States anyway is miles per gallon uh, or MPG for short miles per gallon uh, elsewhere we would probably do this uh, like in Europe we would probably do this as kilometers per liter or something similar and it would give us different numbers but it would still be a measure of fuel efficiency um, and what you can do is uh, same same as this. Uh, you can you can find that by I'm, I'm just going to put E for efficiency, or we could even, yeah just E is fine. Uh, it's the number of miles that you travel divided by the number of gallons of gasoline that you use during that trip. I've got one more example that this time not, not so related to cars. But possibly related in some way to uh, the propagation of a biological organism like a virus. Uh, I'm just going to look at it this way though. A population. Now, a population, what I'm referring to is just a number of organisms. So uh, we can think about a uh, population of humans, global or in a particular area, or we could think of just one little meadow somewhere that has rabbits in it. And it's got a certain number of rabbits. Uh, tomorrow it may have more rabbits though. So that population is changing. Um, and in particular, population changes are of of great interest because that tells us what's going to happen. Is the population going to decline and rabbits go extinct? Or are the rabbits going to keep reproducing until there's uh, the whole surface of the world is covered with rabbits? Both of those would probably be uh, kind of bad. But um, I just want to mention here that a rabbit population increases by 20 rabbits per week. So this is just an example of one way that a rabbit population might grow. Their rabbits do what rabbits do, and the result is more rabbits. So in this situation, there's 20 more rabbits every week in the, in the meadow. Um, this would be, uh, let's say, the population rate of change. So rate of change is an expression that comes up frequently enough that this abbreviation is used, ROC for rate of change. We're not going to use it a lot, but uh, population rate of change is 20 rabbits per week. And I 
could say rabbits per week in, in English, but another way to say that is the number of rabbits per or divided by the number of weeks. Um, you can see that if I did two weeks and it's 20 rabbits per week, that would be an increase of 40 rabbits. Uh, there's 20 more rabbits on the first week, and then there's 20 more rabbits on the second week, so 40, 40 rabbits all together. Increase, an increase of 40 rabbits. All right, so the, this next example is more relevant to us uh, in algebra. Uh, this is an example of what a rate of change would mean, but rather how to find the rate of change of a function. So uh, for this example, we'll find the average rate of change of f of x equals x squared minus 4 on the interval between negative 1 and 3. So I'm, I'm actually going to draw a sketch of this and label some points and we'll get a a better feel from this of what the average rate of change means, but also it'll kind of guide what we're doing to compute it. Um, so here's my my graph of this thing. Uh, so we're going from x equals negative 1 to x equals 3. We're not doing a very wide section of this graph. But um, this is uh, the graph of x squared, and we'll see this in the, in the next section. This is the graph of x squared, which is that parabola, moved downward by 4. So it's actually, uh, sorry, there's the vertex of my parabola. I kind of want to know what these values are. But let's come back to this, because in the process of finding this uh, average rate of change, in the process of finding this, I'm going to actually find the numbers that I need to make a good graph. Uh, I want to use this formula to get this started. This is the change in the function values divided by the change in the x values. So f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. These are my x1 and x2 values. The, the endpoints of my interval, well, those are the x values, negative 1 and 3. The numerator, the f of x values, are what I get when I plug those numbers one at a time into the formula for f of x. So I'm going to write that in here. You could do this as side work, uh, like off to the side somewhere, but I'm going to keep it all so you can see what parts correspond. f of x2, well, f of, what is x2? x2 is my right endpoint, 3, my second x value, of first, second, left to right. If you switched them, this would all still work just fine. I think it just makes sense to have this our first one and this is our second one. So I'm plugging in the second one, minus f of x1 is negative 1. And then I'll plug those x values downstairs, too. Uh, x2 is 3, minus x1 is negative 1. So it's 3 minus negative 1. Now, there's more plugging in to do. Because in the numerator here, I have two expressions. They're both expressions with the function notation. I need to actually find out what they are. Um, f of 3, 3 is when I replace the x with 3. 3 squared is 9 minus 4. 9 minus 4 is 5. That's 
my f of three. I got that from plugging the number three into the, just like we did in the last sec, uh, the last couple sections. Uh, now, minus f of negative one, if I plug in negative one for x, negative one squared is one. One minus four is negative three. Uh, downstairs, I can simplify this. So this is minus negative one. That really means plus one. So this whole thing is four. The, the denominator is four. And here, uh, I'm, to do the next step, I'm going to do something similar. Five minus negative three. That's five plus three. Uh, five minus negative three. So five plus three, which is eight. So I get eight over four, which is equal to... Two. That's my rate of change. Average rate of change. Uh, let's go back and look at this graph. Uh, okay. F of f of three. We found that to be five. So there's my f of three value. Uh, f of negative one. It turned out was negative three. And this this graph. is a, well, not a great parabola, but it's a parabola uh, where this is the value of the function up here at five for the right endpoint, the x value of three. That's a, we call that three, five in the xy plane. And here, when x is negative one, my y value was negative three. F of negative one is negative three. Uh, that's the point, negative 1, negative 3. And what I've just found through this calculation is something you've already done. It's the slope of the line through those two points. This is actually another way to do this type of problem, is to build the graph and just calculate the slope of the line through the two points. But it's really, you're doing the same thing. You're using this formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, the slope formula. And we found that the slope of this line is 2. That's the average rate of change. So next we're going to take a look at some terminology and properties of graphs of functions that are going to help us uh, understand and describe them. And um, I like to look at this in a really simple way. So when we're working with the, the x, y, sorry, the x, y plane, always x, always y, um, we read it left to right in a sense. Like sometimes maybe you're drawing a graph and you're going to the left. But really, if we talk about the way the graph is shaped, we're talking about left to right. And uh, the first term is increasing. And increasing means going up to the right. So some functions only go up to the right. Even functions that aren't curves sometimes only go up to the right. But many functions will go up and then down again, up, maybe up again later too. The corresponding term for going down to the right, so this is increasing here, this is decreasing here. We're going to learn a little more specifically how to describe where it's increasing and decreasing. But decreasing means going down to the right. Uh, going down to the left is increasing because going down to the left is it's going up to the right and we're reading left to right. Uh, that's part of why this arrow is here for the x-axis. The x-axis, uh, it goes that way and it goes that way, but it goes that way. Like that's the, the forward direction of the x-axis. Uh, there's another option here, 
or another possibility. Um, functions are sometimes constant, which I'm just going to, in the, in the spirit of these two terms, just write it as a, going straight to the right. And so maybe my function here uh, goes up, it's increasing, what about here it starts decreasing, and then here it starts going just to the right. So this graph would be would represent a function that increases, then decreases, then goes constant. Um, all right, so with these three terms, um, I think I can I can give you an example of a function a little more specific than this to show you how to say where the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. And I, uh, the, this example that I made is actually very similar. Like I said, it's, it's more precise. Uh, we're just going to go one, two, three, four along the x-axis, and one, two, three along the y-axis, and I'm not going to have any negative x or y values, so we really don't have to use anything over here. Uh, my function is going to go from the origin to the point 0.22, two. and then to the point 3.1. So the x value is 3, the y value is 1, that's what we call 3, 1. And then to the point uh, 4, 1, which has the x value 4, y value 1. So it's, it's going, you can see already, it's increasing, it's decreasing, and it's constant. But this is how you say it. Um, I like to use the, the abbreviation INC for increasing, rather than write that whole word out every time for every problem. Uh, increasing on this interval, 0 to 2. And what I'm talking about there is this interval of x values. That's where it's increasing. What it's increasing to is a different question, but it's the location is the interval over which, or above which, maybe below, but this one's above, the interval where the of x values where the function is going up to the right. Um, similarly, decreasing. So this one is decreasing on, here's the part that's decreasing, that's between the x values of 2 and 3, so I say 2, 3. But these aren't x, y points, these are intervals of x values. Interval notation from 0 to 2, that's all the numbers between 0 and 2. Uh, 2 to 3, that's all the numbers between 2 and 3. And then finally, uh, constant, const, constant on uh, the interval from 3 to 4, in this case. From 3 to 4, that function is uh, neither going up or down as we go to the right, so we say it's constant. On that interval of x values between 3 and 4. Um, there are a couple more terms that are related to increasing and decreasing that are also important, especially for applications. And those are, um, I'm going to write a couple names for them, um, extreme values uh, or uh, maxima and minima. Uh, these, so these are oh, extreme values. You could call them uh, extrema. I think these are irregular English plurals. It's it, extremes. That is a word, but what we're talking about are called extrema, uh, maxima and minima are where the function has its maximum and minimum values. So the maximum is the highest y value and the minimum is, minimum is the lowest y value. 
we're actually talking about something called relative maximum and minimum uh, in terms of maximum relative to the surrounding area or minimum relative to the points nearby on the graph. Uh, here's some pictures. This, this is my local maximum picture. Uh, the, the function goes up and then uh, right at some point it comes down to this right here at the very top of the hill is the maximum value. It's called local because maybe the function goes up further later on, that's still the maximum as in, uh, in the sense of the top of the hill. Uh, another one is the local minimum, uh, which is when the function is decreasing and then increasing. And then there's some point down that's the lowest y value, the smallest, most negative, whatever it is, it's the lowest y value of all the nearby points. That's the local minimum. So what I'm referring to the local maximum is that point. The local minimum is that point. And what we're usually trying to find is a, a couple things. The maximum value and where it occurs. So the, the maximum value itself is a y value, but where it occurs is an x value. Uh, same thing with local minimum. I have an example that will demonstrate both of these. With a curve that's defined by the formula f of x equals x cubed minus x. So x cubed minus x uh, looks like I'm going to sketch it and we're just going to say what the uh, where the values are. So the, the shape is like this. That's not too bad. Uh, okay, so these points are 1 and negative 1. Of course, here is 0. But these points actually occur at the val x values uh, 1 third and negative 1 third. You can find the, the maximum and minimum value by plugging those numbers in. Um, I'm, they're going to be labeled in our problems, either labeled or easy to find. Um, these ones uh, indicate that I have a max, a local max or a relative max, but you can just call it a max. It's a maximum uh, at x equals, well, that, that's the maximum. Not that, that's a minimum. But this maximum occurs at x equals negative one-third. I found the x value. I can plug that negative one-third into this formula and find out what the f of x value is. It's not so much the point in this problem. We're trying to find where they are at x equals negative one-third. The other one is min at, this one occurs at x equals one-third. And that's the type of thing that you're going to want to find for this type of problem. If it says find the maximum value, you can plug those numbers into the function, find the maximum value, and plug that one in to find the minimum value. But where they occur is the point of this exercise. Um, I want to do a little bit more with this one. Because we know where these max and min values are on the x-axis, we can also say that where this function is increasing and decreasing 
because I know where it stops increasing because that maximum is where it turns around and starts to go down. It's increasing all the way up until it gets to x equals negative one third. But where does it start increasing? Well, it's, it's increasing the whole time before that. It's increasing on negative infinity to negative one third. I did not leave myself in the space there, so I'm going to rewrite that. It's increasing on negative infinity to negative one third. This is the interval along the x axis. Uh, it goes, I mean, it's, it starts at negative one. It's all the way over here. It's coming up this whole time until it gets to negative one third. Then it's going down. It's not increasing. We'll come. We'll come back to that in a second. But until it gets to one third, and then it starts going up again. So it's also increasing on one third to uh, that. Just keeps going. It just keeps going, and as the all the way down the line, this is meant to imply that the curve is going up forever. Uh, it's increasing from one-third to infinity. It's actually increasing on both of these intervals. So I use the, the union symbol to join them together. So negative infinity to one-third, negative inf infinity to negative one-third, third rather, union one-third to infinity. That's where the function is increasing. Now decreasing is a little bit simpler to write because it's only this part that's decreasing. Only, only between these two values is it going down to the right. Uh, negative one-third is where it starts decreasing and one-third is where it stops decreasing. It starts increasing again. So this function and its graph which I, unless you have a TI-84 or other graphing calculator, I recommend this uh, Desmos website. It's a, it's a easy way to get a free graphing utility. Uh, and it's just a web app. You type in the formula for the function and it gives you the graph and it's free.